What we saw last week, this is kind of a quick synopsis when I get done in like two minutes, you'll be like, man, you could have done that last week, Pastor Rio, but <laughs> back in time for, well, it's okay, you like uh, the stories that go along with it, but throughout the whole Bible, we see God as a shepherd, right? In the Old Testament and New Testament, we see God as a shepherd, and the good shepherd uh, is what we see Jesus calling himself. We are sheep. The people are referred to as sheep oftentimes. Prophecies about the Messiah. Messiah is the Savior of the world that um, in Judaism they expect to come. We as Christians believe he's come and his name is Jesus. Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. In John 10, 11, he called himself, Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd. And the Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. But what I want you to understand, I think it's incredibly important that you understand this as Christians, that you would understand and grasp, what does that mean that the good shepherd lays down his life for you? And the best way to understand that is by looking at Psalm 23. And when I asked, how many of you love Psalm 23? Last week everyone was like, ah, I love Psalm. you like Psalm 23? Is that a favorite psalm that you have heard before, read before? Um, it, we're gonna, we looked at the first three verses. We went verse by verse and part by part, if you will. And we're going to finish it today, verses 4 through 6. Psalm 23, uh, starting in, in verse 1. I'm just going to give you the, the quick, what we covered last week. The Lord is my shepherd. That's how Psalm 23, verse 1 starts. The Lord is my shepherd. And who can say that? Only those born again by the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit, the mark, with the bear the mark. And um, then you can say, the Lord is truly my shepherd. Then you say, I shall not want. Now, King David, we know, wrote this psalm. And he said he was a shepherd. Um, but I shall not want. When you seek the Lord with all your heart, guess what? You don't want anything else. That's what Matthew 6.33 says. Seek the Lord with all your heart. And everything else will take care of itself. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sheep, sheep can't lay down when there are predators and rivals and bugs. And we're no different. We have life-threatening circumstances that bother us. We have broken relationships that bother us. We have things, little things that bug us all the time. Am I right? Yeah, yeah and that keeps us from lying down. So what was the solution? The solution we saw last week is the simple presence of the good shepherd. When the good shepherd goes out into the field and is in the presence of the sheep, they can then lie down. And so it is with us. We must draw closer to God. We must be in his presence. Then we can lie down in brown pastures or green pastures. We want the green ones? Yes. And how does that happen? How do we have green pastures? Well, God removes your heart of stone, your weeds of sin, your roots of bitterness, your stumps of anger. He knows how to plow through your hard heart and sow seeds of truth. And that's how you lie down in green pastures. And then he leads you beside still waters, not in dirty puddles like my dog likes to drink out of. He takes you to the cool, clean, refreshing water. Jesus told the woman at the well in John 4, I am the living water. That's what we want to drink from. In verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sometimes you can get into a rut in life. You know, maybe it's a habit that you have. Maybe it's an addiction that you have. Maybe it's a, a path that you've gone down and you just don't see the way back. It's not uncommon for people to become like cast sheep. As the old commercial goes, you've fallen. And you can't get up. How do you get rescued? The good shepherd leaves the 99 and comes and rescues you. And that's how he restores your souls. Isn't our good shepherd amazing? Yes. And that's just the first half. Now we have to get into the second half. The second half of Psalm verse 20 or 23 verses 4 through 6. I think you're going to love Psalm 23, the second half. I think you're going to be able to relate, especially verse 4. How many of you have heard verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death? How many of you have heard that at uh, funerals before? It's one of the most commonly read psalms at funerals. 
even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Would you agree that nobody really wants to walk through the valley of the shadow of death? Is it safe to say that nobody cares to go through the valley of the shadow of death? I mean, if there is an easier way, Americans will find that way and take it. We love shortcuts, don't we? We love to search, scroll, click, deliver. That's how I do my Christmas shopping, I don't know about you. We love shortcuts. We love to say, hey Siri, order me a pizza. And somehow, magically, in an hour, the doorbell rings. How did that happen? We love our shortcuts. Do you think I stayed up until 11.30 to watch Michigan football win the Big Ten Championship last night? No! I woke up this morning, I recorded it, and I fast forwarded through all of the commercials. I watched the game in an hour. We love shortcuts. We like the easy way. We love easy. Raise your hand. We love easy. Difficult? Nah, no thanks. Nobody chooses to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But the valley is not an option. Because life happens. Stuff happens. We all go through the valley at one time or another. We have to go through trials and tribulations. Are you in the valley right now? Is life taking you through a valley? Is there a trial, a tribulation? Are you worried about something? Are you living daily with a lot of stress and anxiety? Is your relationship in conflict? Are you short on money? Are you grieving a loss? The pandemic put everyone in the valley. Let's be honest. They said two weeks will flatten the curve. Yeah, it's been two years. You can take your two weeks and shove it where the sun don't shine, right? It's still going. You're still in the valley. There's still people that are living in fear and stress because of this pandemic. We're there. We've all been there. And we'll be there again. It's the valley. But if you've ever been in the valley, how do you respond? To being in the valley. Because a lot of people ask, why? Why? Why am I in this valley? Why am I in this difficult circumstance in my life? Why is this happening to me? You ever ask that question? Yeah. A lot of people ask that question. And the answer is right here in Psalm 23. Yeah. Usually I don't say that. Usually I say, well, you're not supposed to ask why. That's God's business. Right? Look, read Job. All right? Don't ask why. That's God's business. But the answer is right here in Psalm 23. Why? Why is this happening to me? Why am I in the valley of the shadow of death? Why? I'm going to answer it right now in Psalm 23. But before I do, you have to grasp a whole year in the life of a shepherd and a sheep. I don't know if you ever looked at Psalm 23 like, like that before. Understood, as I mentioned, um, Philip Keller's book, uh, a shepherd's, you know, look. He was a shepherd, modern day shepherd, and he looked at um, this psalm, and, and he's he's written um, a beautiful book, little book um, that you can pick up for yourself. But when you look at the whole year of a shepherd and sheep, you begin to understand Psalm 23. You see, we're going to start in the winter because it's winter right now, right? Um, the snow is coming, and when it's winter, the sheep stay at the home of the shepherd, in the home pasture, if you will. They don't go very <coughs> far. They don't travel. They don't do much. There, there really isn't much daylight to do stuff. Um, honestly, they just try not to freeze to death. That pretty much describes my winter. All right, that's how I feel about winter. Just don't freeze to death, Matt, okay? Stay warm, and pretty soon it'll be daylight for longer than six hours. Uh, I feel like that's what winter is like. I'm not a fan, okay? <coughs> Spring comes, though, and that's when most lambs are born. The lambs are born in the spring. Females, by the way, are ewe lambs, spelled E-W-E, and males are ram lambs. You don't really need to know that. I just wanted to tell you what a male lamb is, because I think it's the coolest name ever. You're a ram lamb. I mean, that is just a fun name. For one year, you're a ram lamb. As spring turns to summer, 
the journey begins. The heat is too much at home, so you have to travel to higher, cooler altitudes. How do you get there? How do you get to the higher ground? Through the valley of the shadow of death. Now you're starting to see it. Why does the good shepherd take his sheep through the valley of the shadow of death? Because that's how you get to the higher ground. It's the easiest grade. It's not steep. You're not trying to climb rocks to get up there. There's food in the valley. There's clean water in the valley. It's the way to the higher ground. But understand this. The valley is not your home. The valley is a passageway to higher ground. Don't forget that. The valley is not your home. You're not meant to be there forever. So why is it the valley of the shadow of death? And the answer is, in a sheep, in their life, they have predators, lots of predators. And when you're walking through a valley, you're at the lowest point, the predators can hide out on the higher points. They have a better vantage point. They can sneak up a little bit easier. So it's definitely dangerous to be walking through the valley. You're kind of like a sitting duck, as we would say, duck hunters would say. Um, yeah, you're, you're just kind of there, and you're easy prey. The other thing that you don't realize is that sometimes a storm will come through the valley, and sometimes it's really cold water and cold air, and if the sheep get too wet, they could freeze to death. So danger is always a possibility. Uh, death um, is sometimes imminent when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death but you go through it to get to higher ground. So the goal is not to avoid the valley. <clears throat> so many times we as Christians want to avoid the valleys in our lives. The goal is not to avoid it. Don't complain when you're in the valley. Don't ask, why, 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 why? And when we're in the valley, we always want to ask why. Uh, the goal of the valley is survival. You're trying to survive. Make it through to the higher ground. And how do you survive? What is the way to survive? The answer is stay close to the good shepherd. Stay close. Think about what verse 4 says. The second part of verse 4 says, I will fear no evil. Why? Say it with me. <clears throat> you are with me. Why will you fear no evil? You are with me. Just remember that. You don't have to fear evil because he is with you. You know fear and faith are opposites. You've heard that before. You've seen that probably on some sticker or some meme or something like that. The valley doesn't go away, but fear can go away when you put your faith in. It's basically the gist of it, right? Stay close to the good shepherd. Hold on to Jesus. Draw near to God. And he will protect you. He will comfort you. The next part of the verse says, How does the good shepherd protect you in the valley? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The shepherd doesn't take a lot of things with them when he's traveling. Really, it doesn't take a lot. I'm sure back uh, a long, long, long time ago, um, they took very little. Today, they probably can take a few more things through the uh, modern day technology and such. But two things they never leave home without, their rod and their staff. Of course, today they might have an American Express card. Who knows? Never leave home without. But the rod is first. The rod is the shepherd's weapon. I don't know if you understand the difference between the two. Maybe you have. Maybe you've studied Psalm 23 before. Maybe you've read a commentary on it before. But there's a significant difference between the rod and the staff. The rod is the weapon. A shepherd will pick a young tree, dig it up, and at the base, he will cut off the roots. At the base of the young tree, it, it's sort of enlarged. It's, it's like a club head, if you will. And then the other end, where he will hold on to it, he will, he will whittle it to shape to fit his hand perfectly. And then he will practice 
so that he has precision and accuracy because the rod is an extension of his right hand. It represents power and authority. And he can throw that thing. I mean, I could probably take out Brandon back there in the sound booth if I was a shepherd with my rod. Boom. So there are going to be enemies out there, right? Coyotes, there's going to be snakes. There's going to be all kinds of things that the shepherd has to take out with his rod. The rod is power and authority. By the way, Moses demonstrated God's power with his rod. Didn't he? That's right. And the rod today speaks of God's word. God's word has power. I understand there are people today who don't believe that. They just think the Bible is just a book, just a bunch of stories in there. Some don't make sense. Some of them are weird. Some of them are scary, gory. The Bible is got all of that. But the Bible is God's word, living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It's like a rod that can have power and authority. And it also disciplines. It brings discipline into your life. The sheep could head towards a poisonous plant because out in the valley, there are poisonous plants that they cannot eat. If they eat them, they will die. And the shepherd knows what they look like. And so if he sees one heading towards it, he just gives them a little thump in the head. Nope, stay away from that. You don't want to go near that. It disciplines them. Psalm 119.11 I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word of God keeps us from sinning. 2 Timothy 3, one of my favorite two verses, 16 and 17. All scripture, all of God's word, it's God breathed. Pneuma, the spirit, he breathed into men who moved the pen. God breathed these words. The scripture, all we have, it's all God breathed. And it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training you so you are prepared for every good work. That's God's word. It's powerful. It has authority. It disciplines us. And the rod is used by the sheep to examine them. To make sure that they are healthy. As I told you last week, out in the pasture, uh, there, there is um, um, built up some, some rock pens, if you will, to protect them at night. And there is no door. I showed you that picture last week. There is no door because who's the door? Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep. Because the shepherd is the door. The, the shepherd sleeps in the doorway. And then when he wants to let them out... One at a time, he puts his rod out, and then as they come under his rod, he examines them. He checks them out to make sure that they are healthy. If you've ever gotten a letter home as a parent that someone in your child's class has lice, you will investigate your children's hair like this shepherd does with the sheep's wool. Man, you'll dig nothing, 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 and, and you're, you're afraid, right? That you're going to see something like this if you've ever been there. It's a horrible thing. But the shepherd does not want the wool pulled over his eyes when it comes to infections or disease. And so he will investigate, he will examine the sheep. What does Psalm 139, verse 23 say? Search me. O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. What a psalm that is. Let that be your prayer. Because you will never pull the wool over God's eyes. Am I right? He knows everything. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. You know my thoughts. If there is anything wicked in me, let me confess it to you so I can be forgiven. And then... There is the shepherd's staff 
the shepherd's staff. If the rod is an example of God's word with its power and its authority, the staff, which you know is longer, has like a crook on the end, right? The staff. Okay? The staff represents the Holy Spirit with the fruit of the Spirit, the love and the patience and the gentleness. It's not uncommon for a shepherd to take the end of his staff and to walk next to his favorite sheep with the staff touching the sheep. Just kind of walking right alongside that sheep. And that sheep feels that staff right, right next to him. It's like they're walking hand in hand. That, that love of the shepherd that he has for his favorite sheep. And then with that crook on the end, the shepherd can, can take a, a sheep that needs careful examination and sort of hug it and pull it in closer to himself. He can draw the sheep closer to himself. And then with those baby lambs, when they get sort of separated from their mother and they need to return to their mother and he doesn't want to get his smell on them, so he, he lifts them up with that crook and he puts, puts them back with the mother. The shepherd's staff is a representation of the Holy Spirit. How he guides us and he comforts us. Don't we all need the Holy Spirit to guide us and to comfort us? That's why Paul urged the church in Galatia, if we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step. Let's walk with the Spirit. So if you're in a valley today, you need to know this. Your good shepherd has a rod and he has a staff to protect you, to comfort you. His word and his Holy Spirit is what you need when you're in the valley of the shadow of death. Can I get a big amen for that? Amen. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We sang that song last week. What's the name of that song? This is how I fight my battles. You prepare a table before me. Do you remember that song from last week? Wonderful song. But I never really understood what it meant that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Be honest. Raise your hand if you just don't really understand what that means. And uh, you can keep, you can put your hand up if you thought it was a kitchen table, a dining table, or any table in your house. Because it doesn't mean that. <laughs> and that's kind of what my mind goes. Is that, what's he talking about? What kind of table? Because I want to get that table. I'd be a cool table to have. No, it's no furniture. No, this table is the tabletop of the mountain. That's what this table is all about. That's what David is saying when he writes this. It's the plateau where the sheep will spend the summer. When they come out of the valley of the shadow of death and they get to that higher ground, that table, that flat plateau, that's the table. And how does he prepare the table? The shepherd will go up in the springtime a couple, couple times, and he will prepare this table. He, he'll clean out the water holes, make sure, make sure they're cleaned up, and he'll remove it, you know, he'll pull weeds. Keller says that he'd take his boys up there and then make some games out of it. And they'd, they'd pull a lot of poisonous plants out of there so the sheep wouldn't get to them. He gets it ready for the sheep. Now just think about this. How did Jesus, your good shepherd, prepare your table? He went up on Calvary. He went up on that hill and he died on the cross so that you will be prepared to go to heaven. Just let that sink in. Your good shepherd has prepared a table for you. This verse says that our good shepherd prepares a table and he does it in the presence of our enemies. You see, even on higher ground, the sheep are not completely safe. We're always in the presence of enemies. Even when you are on a spiritual high, you're not really completely safe. You're always going to be in the presence of enemies. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 5 8 Be sober minded, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, 
prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And think about the disciples when they sat in the upper room when Jesus had the first communion with them. Think about who was with them. Eleven disciples were friends. The twelfth was an enemy, Judas Iscariot. And Jesus said, But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. That's what he said. And I know that's other places in the New Testament that talk about that, but I think Jesus was thinking about Psalm 23 right there. On this table is an enemy. I prepare this table in the presence of my enemies. We'll never be completely safe until we enter our permanent home because we are citizens of heaven, not citizens of this place. This is a, this is, some of us would they say this whole time is a valley that we're going through until we get to heaven. We keep going to verse 5. Verse 5, not only does he prepare a table for us, but he anoints our head with oil. He anoints our head with oil. During the summer months, sheep and probably all animals are bothered all the time by bugs and flies. Specifically, the nasal fly will land on a sheep's wet nose and lay its eggs, and if they hatch, they will travel up the nose. I know this is grossing you out, but I gotta tell you it. Because if they get in there and live in there, in the sheep's head, it will drive them nuts. The sheep will actually ram their head into trees to try to get it to stop. Sometimes they die because they keep ramming their head because of these bugs. So it's very important that the shepherd anoints their head. He has a mixture of oil that he puts together and he puts it on their head to keep these bugs, these flies, from laying their eggs. And the oil, as we know in Scripture, as I talk about when we have the baby dedication, the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That we need an anointing of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because the Holy Spirit always represents power. Think about what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. You can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth only if you have the power of the Holy Spirit. He told them, wait, when he rose from the dead. When he rose from the dead and he, and he ascended back to be with the Father. He said, wait, wait for who? <clears throat> wait for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, you have the power of the Holy Spirit and then you can be my witnesses. And they did. And there's a place in Acts 4.31 where it says, they prayed... And the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, like an earthquake happened, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now think about that verse. How do you receive the anointing, whoop, the power of the Holy Spirit? That was anti anticlimactic there. That was my communion cup. How do they receive the Holy Spirit? They prayed. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about that. Pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit to fill you. And then you'll have the power to do God's will. Verse 5 finishes with, My cup overflows. Not only are the bugs a problem for sheep, so they must have their head anointed with oil, but also is a disease called scab. It's a parasite that gets on their skin, kind of like lice. And basically, they need to have uh, a treatment of full submersion in a tub of antiseptic. Now, this is very confusing for a sheep. I read about this from Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot um, was married to Jim Elliot, one of those missionaries that was killed. Um, if you ever saw the movie The End of the Spear, they were trying to bring the gospel to the uh, Aka tribe, and, and they um, they were killed, they were martyred for their faith, but they persisted and, and continued to minister to them and saw them come to Christ. Elizabeth Elliot went on to be a great writer, and she was sharing this in one of her books, that the good shepherd takes the infected sheep, fully submerses it into a tub of antiseptic, 
And if you ever gave a child a bath, a wild child, you know the bathtub water goes everywhere. All right? It overflows. I'm sure when the sheep are being submerged, they don't really understand what's going on. They're confused. But if they don't get submerged, they will die. They need this treatment. So just think about that. When God submerses you, don't fight it. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. He's your good shepherd. He has a purpose. And your cup overflows. Finally, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Verse 6. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now there's an interesting word in that verse there. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now we've already seen how it's led, right, the sheep. The, the good shepherd leads the sheep. And you follow him, you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of your faith. He, he continues to, to bless you with his grace and his mercy and his goodness and all of that. But how does goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life? Well, what this means here, David understood. If you know the life of David, you know he understood the importance of leaving a godly legacy. When you live a godly life, you will leave a godly legacy. David was the one who put all the materials together so that his son Solomon could build the temple. When you live a godly life, you leave behind a godly legacy. The older you get, the more you should be thinking about your legacy. What impact will you have on the generations after you? Not too many years ago, this church, Life Purpose, had one retired couple. Can you believe that? This church had one retired couple not too many years ago. The average age of our church was well under 40. And people under their, that are under 40 are not thinking about their legacies. They're too busy chasing around their little rascals everywhere. Me included. You know, I, we were there too. We had little ones. Ours are our teens now. But I'm so thankful that the Lord has blessed this church with a variety of ages. Because I think everybody should be mentoring and being mentored. Paul and Timothy is that wonderful mentoring relationship that we see in Scripture. Paul wrote to Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy in your Bible. He's writing to him. He mentored him. We need mentors. You need to be mentored. You need to mentor somebody else. I wrote a letter to Wes. As you know, Grace and Wes, Wes, um, they're, he's in his 20s. They're newly married. And he um, felt the call to join the Michigan National Guard. He's there right now in basic training. And the only the way he can communicate is through letters. And so I wrote him a letter. I felt like I was writing third Timothy. <laughs> I mean, I was... I was just sharing with him the word and encouraging him and trying to build him up. Friends, I want to encourage you. Leave a godly legacy by living a godly life. Pour into others. Be a good shepherd to others. Our glory days are days we spend glorifying him and his kingdom. You can retire from your job, that's fine, but you can't retire from your commitment to God's church. Amen? You know who sticks out in my mind this year? I mean, so many of you have blessed me in so many ways. But there's four men that really stick out in my mind that have been a blessing to me. And all four of them are retired. I think about Vince, who's come to this church and spent hours and hours working on things, getting things taken care of within this church, helping me. Um, a good friend of mine, Carmen, he's been retired for a while. He comes and helps do all kinds of things, always calls me up and takes me out to lunch. Howard, who fills in for me as a preacher, you know him, he, he's retired, but he not only does he come and preach, but he prays for me all the time. I just talked to him this week. And Dale, uh, Barry's brother, as you know, is always taking care of things in this building, and he's always willing to help out. These are retired men that I believe are leaving a legacy. They are pouring in to others. They are pouring into me. Will goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life? I pray that it will. Psalm 23 is much 
to be thankful for. It's so much more than just something we should read at funerals. There's so many blessings when you really understand that the Good Shepherd lays down his life for you. You have one life. You should make it count. Admit it. If you don't have all the answers, and just believe that God does and draw close to Him. And I don't care if you've told God a thousand times you were going to trust Him, you were going to do things His way. Maybe you came to church today and you're just like, I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to start reading my Bible. And then a week later, you're kind of back in those old ways. Because old habits die hard, don't they? But who cares? Make today 1001. You can do it. You can confess to him that you need him. You need him to guide you. You need him to lead you. And you need him to walk beside you. So make that your prayer today. In fact, I think you should sing that. That you want God to guide you and lead you and walk beside you. That's my cue. That's my that's a, There, my wife understood the cue. That, that you will be guided and led by God. And he will walk beside you.